Welcome back to the Hard Unbox News Corner. May is typically one of the slower months in the year for tech news as a lot of companies choose to hold off their announcements for Computex and E3, but this year without those major shows going ahead, we've had a fair bit more news trickle out over time. Of course, this week we had Nvidia's GTC presentation, which was delayed from earlier in the year. And I think we can expect more companies to do their own sort of announcements across the next few weeks to compensate for not being able to present stuff at those sorts of trade shows. Earlier this week, we also discussed at length AMD's current situation with 400 and 300 series motherboards not supporting Zen 3 processors. At this stage, we don't have any further updates to share on this, although we do expect AMD to provide some clarification around the situation soon, perhaps with a better or at least more in-depth explanation than the biosize reason that the community pretty easily debunked. So stay tuned on that. Still gathering further thoughts from motherboard partners as well. I don't think this is going to be the end of that particular story. But let's kick off the news topics of this week with a look at NVIDIA's GTC announcements as delivered by Jensen Huang in his kitchen. <laughs> we did see a few people expecting GeForce announcements here or at least some form of gaming related discussion. But as NVIDIA had said from the very start, this event was mostly focused on data center, AI, deep learning type products with virtually zero mention of gaming. Hopefully not too many of you were expecting a GeForce 30 series announcement because that's still a while away. A lot of what NVIDIA talked about is not stuff we'd normally cover like server hardware, supercomputers, $200,000 accelerators and all that sort of thing. So we're going to skip 99% of that information. If you really want to know what is going on and going into the you know, DGX A100 with its eight GPUs, AMD Epic processors and all of that, I think there's plenty of great sources out there that will dive into the data center side of the announcements and all the benefits that Nvidia are claiming. But what I did want to focus on here is the new Ampere architecture that Nvidia announced officially during this event. Nvidia were mostly focused on what Ampere would be bringing to their new A100 GPU, which is an accelerator board, not a consumer graphics card, but they did confirm that this architecture would also be making its way to gaming products. Specifically, Jensen said that between enterprise and consumer integrations of Ampere, there would be great overlap in the architecture, but not in the configuration. And I think this is a really important note to make because if you look at the makeup of the A100 GPU, it's clear that this sort of product is simply not feasible for say a GeForce graphics card. The A100 is an 826 square millimeter die built on seven nanometer, which is a massive die that no doubt would be extremely expensive to manufacture with good enough yields. But not only that, it has six stacks of HBM2, which itself is quite expensive, and it has a rated TDP of 400 watts, which is much higher than you'd expect from a consumer GPU. So when Jensen says there won't be overlap in the configuration, this is likely what he means. We won't be seeing this exact GA100 GPU come across to gaming products, but we will see the general architecture used in other GPUs that are configured a bit differently using GDDR memory instead of HBM being one example of a configuration difference NVIDIA will likely use for gaming class GPUs. But let's talk a bit more about the A100 to see exactly what NVIDIA has been able to achieve here. The A100 board uses what NVIDIA calls the A100 Tensor Core GPU implementation of their GA100 GPUs. GA100 overall as a fully unlocked GPU includes eight GPU processing clusters for a total of 128 SMs and 8,192 CUDA cores. There's also 512 third generation tensor cores with this latest tensor core generation being more powerful than anything before. There's also six HBM2 stacks with 12 512 bit memory controllers. And that's a lot of hardware packed into that 826 square millimeters. Meanwhile, the A100 Tensor Core GPU, and therefore the A100 board overall, features a cut down GA100 with seven GPU processing clusters. This sees 108 SMs and 6,912 CUDA cores, along with 432 Tensor Cores and five of the six HBM2 stacks being accessible. So what can we learn from this information? Well, for starters, Nvidia has been bold in opting for roughly the same GPU size as with Volta and GV100, which was an 815 square millimeter die built on 12 nanometer. Fully unlocked GV100 dies packed 5,376 scooter cores. So when you compare that to fully unlocked GA100, Nvidia has been able to cram in 52% more CUDA cores with this new architecture, while also chewing up more than 2.5 times the transistors, all within roughly the same area. 
However, we never saw the full implementation of GV100 with products like the V100 Accelerator, Quadro GV100, and Titan V all using a cut down GPU with 5120 CUDA cores. This meant that 4 out of the 84 SMs were disabled. With the A100 and GA100, a greater portion has been cut off with 20 disabled SMs. This is likely a reflection of how much more difficult it is to get decent yields out of a huge 7 nanometer die because they've disabled 16% of the SMs with this new GPU compared to just 5% previously. So as it stands right now, the A100 features 35% more CUDA cores than the V100, but due to lower clock speeds around the 1400MHz mark compared to over 1500MHz for V100, NVIDIA is touting total FP32 and FP64 performance around 25% higher than their Volta product. However, this is the lowest performance improvement NVIDIA is claiming with Ampere. For starters, we're seeing a huge jump in memory bandwidth going from 900 gigabytes per second to 1.6 terabytes per second, thanks to 2.4 gigabits per second HBM2 stacks. There's also just more VRAM available, 40 gigabytes up from a maximum of 32 gig with Volta. And then there's a bunch of key performance gains to other formats outside FP32 and FP64. NVIDIA shows up to a 20 times improvement using their new TF32 format, but there are other huge gains for formats like FP16 and INT8, especially when tensor accelerated. So if you have an application where these other formats can be utilized, AMP is going to be a huge upgrade. While a lot of the focus here is clearly on data center applications that benefit from accelerators, the question on a lot of people's minds is, what does this all mean for gaming when NVIDIA announces GeForce products? And the answer is, well, it's too hard to say given this simply isn't the configuration we'll see for gaming cards. For example, this GPU doesn't have ray tracing cores or an NVENC encoder engine, both of which will feature in NVIDIA's gaming configuration. All we know for certain is that NVIDIA are able to cram in many more transistors thanks to TSMC's 7 nanometer process technology, but even then it's unclear whether NVIDIA's entire gaming stack will leverage TSMC 7 nanometer. We've seen a 50% increase in CUDA cores with the same die size, but we don't know how, for example, the Tensor Core will be configured with other Ampere GPUs. It uses a lot of space on this die, so they might shrink that down for the gaming products. Who knows? And of course, would impact what NVIDIA is able to achieve. I'm sure there are many people that are desperate for next-gen gaming GPU news and will want to read into this as deep as possible, but yeah, I don't think that's all that reasonable based on today's announcements. I think the GA100 is a super interesting GPU, and a lot of what NVIDIA are doing here is, yeah, very interesting, but we'll just have to wait for that GeForce launch later in the year to see what they're doing with consumer Ampere. Well, that was a lot of talking about a GPU, time to move into some other topics. Earlier this week, Epic Games unveiled their latest iteration of their game engine called Unreal Engine 5. This engine is built for the next generation of games and was shown running in real time on a PlayStation 5, which AMD was quick to mention is powered by RDNA 2 GPU architecture. I'm not a game developer, so a lot of the nitty gritty details are well over my head. However, there are some incredibly impressive achievements here. One is called Nanite Virtualized Micro Polygon Geometry, which apparently allows game developers to create much more highly detailed environments than were possible before, with millions or even billions of polygons down to pixels in size. Everything is scaled at real time for the best performance. Epic also detailed Lumen, which is a dynamic global illumination system that doesn't use pre-baked lighting, but can react to changes in the environment. Right at the end of the video, Epic showed off this fast running scene, which was probably designed to show the streaming capabilities of the engine on a fast SSD like is found in the PlayStation 5. The demo is quite impressive on a number of levels and has a noticeable next-gen feel to the graphics, but it's not exactly the first engine demo we've seen that has looked very impressive. Often these sorts of demos far exceed what game developers actually put into their games. Not saying this sort of fidelity is impossible in real world games, but we rarely see the full benefits on show, especially initially. Also, the demo was running on a PlayStation 5 at just 1440p 30fps and without ray tracing, so this is really stretching the console to its limits. I do enjoy a good demo from time to time, but I do have my doubts around the feasibility of this specific demo in games. We'll have to see though. Unreal Engine 5 will be available as a preview in early 2021 before being available as a full release later in the year. It will support all current and next-gen consoles plus PC, Mac, and smartphone operating systems. Igor's lab has received details of AMD's upcoming Ryzen 4000 desktop APUs. Well, 
I guess they've received just a list of engineering samples, some of which are known mobile APUs, and the other appears to be the desktop parts. The base hardware used for Ryzen 4000 is the Renoir die, so nothing unusual here, up to 8 CPU cores, 16 threads, plus 8 Vega compute units, DDR4 3200 memory controllers, and all that stuff. What people are interested in are things like clock speeds and core configurations, so this is what the leak suggests. Igor's lab spotted 12 individual units split into 6 with a 65 watt TDP and 6 with a 35 watt TDP. The charts are a little hard to read given they're likely meant for engineering eyes only, but there appear to be two quad cores, two six core, and two eight core SKUs at each TDP level. And then specs for each of those two models and any one core configuration appear the same. So it's possible one would end up as a regular model and the other as a pro model. By the looks of things, AMD is hitting a base clock between 3.6 and 3.8 GHz within 65 watts, with lower base for the higher core count parts. Boost clocks then vary between 4.1 GHz for the quad core option, up to 4.45 GHz for the 8 core variant. These clocks are very similar to AMD's existing Zen 2 desktop CPUs without an iGPU, the main difference being Renoir only has 8 MB of level 3 cache, compared to 32 MB for the CPU only equivalent. On the GPU front, it appears the 8 core CPU models are paired with 8 GPU compute units, and then that falls to 7 CUs with a 6 core CPU and 6 CUs with a quad core CPU. Clock speeds are as high as 2100 MHz peak, which is pretty decent for an iGPU. Will be pretty interesting to see how accurate that is. Normally, the clocks are a bit lower for the 35 watt models as well. As always, you should take the leaks like this with a grain of salt, but this is pretty close to what we've already seen on the mobile side, so I'd expect specifications around this mark when the desktop APUs arrive. As for why we don't have desktop APUs yet, well, AMD would want to be selling as many of these dies as possible into laptop products where they can hit a larger margin uh, before they then push them out to desktop. So it shouldn't be too far away until we see these sorts of things, but that would explain the delay. One question that I get asked a fair bit in the Q&A series is, when are HDMI 2.1 monitors going to become a thing? Well, that question has been answered this week with Eve announcing that two of their three upcoming Spectrum monitors will feature HDMI 2.1 connectors. The models in question are the Spectrum QHD, which has a 1440p IPS display running at 240Hz, along with the Spectrum 4K and its 4K 144Hz IPS display. The cheaper 1440p 144Hz model misses out, but it has a launch price below $400, so I think that's understandable. While EVE are the first to hop on the HDMI 2.1 train, these monitors aren't coming anytime soon with the release date of Q4 for all but the QHD 144Hz model, which is set for quarter one of 2021. AMD has announced the Radeon Pro 7, a new workstation card using their 7 nanometer Vega GPU, first seen in the, of course, Radeon 7. In fact, this is basically just a Radeon 7 from a specification perspective. Same 60 compute units, almost the same 1700 MHz clock speed, same 2 gigabits per second HBM2 stacks with 16 gigabytes of VRAM. The Radeon Pro 7 does feature half-rate FP64 support, which is an improvement on the quarter rate available with the Radeon 7, plus it also has Infinity Fabric links for connecting to other GPUs in a workstation. The launch price for the Radeon Pro 7 is $1,900 US dollars, which is a hefty price, but not unusual for a high-end workstation card. Aside from a few small feature unlocks, you're also paying for all of the certification that comes with the workstation product, which is why they are widely used by professionals over consumer GPUs that offer nearly the same hardware. Final topic for this week is that Grand Theft Auto V is free on the Epic Games Store until May 21, and it's yours to keep forever if you claim during this period. Not much more to say on this one. It appears the Epic Games Store was hard hit when this news first came out, overwhelmed significantly by the traffic, but hopefully that has started to come down at this point. It's a pretty good deal, to be honest, for one of the most critically acclaimed games of this generation. So if you don't already own a copy of GTA V, get on that. Um, and yeah. That's it for this week's News Corner. As always, you can subscribe for our little news roundups that we'd like to do every so often. You can also support us on Patreon if you're interested in getting access to our Discord chat where we chat about all the news as it's happening. We've got our live streams in there as well. And yeah, I think that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.